Hello, my name's Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist in London. I assess mentally disordered offenders. I also work as an expert witness, so I give evidence in criminal trials all across the UK. In June 2021, CrimeCon is coming to the UK. It will be full of experts such as myself and also law enforcement agents. They'll also be your favourite YouTubers and podcast makers. So I really hope to see you there. In Las Vegas, an ex-convict is back to his old ways. Big money cons, low-level burglary, and violent assaults. Local police track him, but he's gone. The FBI joins the case, and the violence escalates. To capture the desperate fugitive, authorities need to anticipate his next move. Women are most often assaulted by someone they know, but sometimes a stranger attacks. Near Las Vegas in December of 2000, a young woman became the latest victim of a violent sex offender. Before authorities could locate him, he would add murder to his list of crimes. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. FBI agents tracked the armed fugitive across the country, and as they closed in, the gunman was determined to avoid capture at any cost. Las Vegas, Nevada. Beneath the bright lights are thousands of workers keeping the town running and criminals ready to take whatever they can. Early on the morning of December 11, 2000, in the Las Vegas suburb of Henderson, a 17-year-old waitress was on her way to work. In a parking lot, a man offered her a ride to work. Who's going to work? She declined. Go. Get in. Get in. Open. Hurry up, move it. Get in. His gun stopped Go. her from crying out. He drove her to a secluded area where he sexually assaulted her. As soon as she could, she took her only chance and fled, running to a nearby restaurant to call 911. Henderson police took the call. Are you injured? Do you need an ambulance, ma'am? The girl gave a description of her attacker and his vehicle. Did he have any weapons? The patrol officer headed to the restaurant to interview the young woman and take her to a nearby medical center. En route, he spotted a red sports car that matched the description given by the victim. When the officer approached, the driver sped away. As they neared the city and busier streets, the suspect's driving became more erratic. 
the officer decided the risk to civilians was too great and pulled back. But police now had the vehicle's license plate number. Henderson PD ran the tags and traced the vehicle to a Las Vegas address. Las Vegas detective Barry Jensen contacted the owner, who explained he had given the car to his daughter to use. The owner said he and his daughter, Rachel Mills, would meet Detective Jensen at her apartment. She had just gotten off work from a local casino. When the detective arrived, he told them about the car eluding police who had reported sexual assault. Rachel said that her husband had the car that morning. He had dropped her off at work at 5 a.m. and she had not seen him since. She hoped there had been some mistake. She knew that he had been arrested for sexual assault in the past. She knew that he had been in prison but she didn't believe any of that was true, or she didn't want to believe that any of that was true. Rachel had noticed their car had been parked across the lot. Detective Jensen asked her to check the apartment and see if her husband had returned. He and her father would check out the car. Looking around the apartment, she realized that her husband had taken most of his belongings. It appeared as if he had left her. The father owned the car, but since Rachel and her husband were the regular drivers, only they could consent to a search. His stuff is gone. His clothes, the, the drawers, his, uh, all the stuff he keeps on the dresser, uh, photos, I don't know. Everything seems it's gone. Did yeah. you give me your verbal consent to search the car without getting a search warrant? Oh, okay. 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 So you got a set of keys. Uh, yeah. Though shaken by what was happening, Rachel gave Jensen permission to search the vehicle. The detective believed the placement of the car far from the apartment was telling. In my opinion, it was hidden in the parking lot. I think he knew the police were going to find his apartment. If his car wasn't parked right out front, I think he felt that he, he had more time. He was creating more distance between law enforcement and himself. Inside the car, Jensen noticed that the few personal effects matched what the assault victim described pointing more suspicion toward Rachel's husband. She said he didn't have a regular job, but beyond that, Rachel and her father were unable to give the detective much more information. All they were able to tell us was that he loved to play blackjack and craps. They had no idea where he was getting the money to do that. Jensen called for crime scene technicians to process the car in case there was unseen evidence inside. It's going to be about 15 minutes for the tow truck to get here. Um, he had to tell Rachel that her husband was a strong suspect in the assault of a 17-year-old girl. Um, At his request, she gave Jensen a photo of her husband, Magfour Mansour. If Mansour was the assailant, Jensen hoped the victim could ID him based on the photo. I want you to look at every picture. At the police station, Detective Jensen interviewed the young woman. She identified Magfour Mansour as her attacker. Nevada police charged him with kidnapping and sexual assault. Jensen found that Mansour had an extensive rap sheet He'd been arrested several times for sexual related offenses, sexual assault, open and gross lewdness. He'd also been arrested for burglaries, credit card fraud, and weapons violations. 
While in prison, Mansour had been diagnosed with a severe personality disorder that bordered on sociopathic. He was a sophisticated con artist. He could make people do things that they wouldn't normally do. He was a serial rapist and a career criminal. For several days, police had no good leads on the case. Then Jensen got a tip from a new ally. Sexual assault, Jensen. Mansoor's father in law. Yeah, Richard. He'd been digging around, talking to family friends, and he knew that Mansoor was a big gambler at one of the local hotels, and he felt that he would have a room there. I found that he did have a room that was comped because he was a large money player. Since hotel security had cameras in the hallways, the detective asked them to watch and call police if anyone entered Mansoor's room. They weren't set up to make an arrest or to grab Mansoor. I didn't feel comfortable asking them to because I believed that he was dangerous. That night, a security officer spotted a man entering Mansoor's room. He immediately contacted Las Vegas police. He has hotel security. He has returned to the hotel. Okay. Detectives were on their way. But the man exited the room less than a minute after he went in and casually slipped away. When the vice squad detectives arrived, they checked his room. We found a suitcase and some family pictures, nothing else that would help her further our investigation. They searched the entire hotel casino, but there was no sign of Mansoor. They realized in order to find him, they needed more resources, and turned the case over to Special Agent Scott Backen and Detective Brian Dunaway of the Las Vegas FBI's Criminal Apprehension Team, a multi-agency squad responsible for tracking down fugitives in the Las Vegas area. The squad's first step was to distribute informational sheets about Mansoor to area hotels. When we have someone that we're looking for and we believe that he's gone to a hotel or something, we have a system called TRAX, T-R-A-X, which is a, uh, it's a fancy fax machine. It allows us to send digital, color digital photos to large groups of people simultaneously to uh, alert them. Um, those people that don't have TRAX alerts, we uh, went to old-fashioned police work. We were knocking on doors and delivering these things and, and conducting interviews and making sure that everyone knew about him. We're looking for this guy right here. He comes under a few different aliases. Investigators check registers for known aliases of Mansoor. They found nothing. These two gentlemen are from the FBI. But some security personnel recognize Mansoor as a suspect in a string of room burglaries plaguing the Vegas Strip. They described his frequent cons. They said Mansoor preyed on tourists, mostly those of Middle Eastern or Asian origin. Okay, thank you. He would often pose as a, a translator or as a tour guide, and uh, he would do this in order to gain the confidence of people that were in town who had money. After gaining their confidence, he would use this information to usually enter their rooms because he was able to contact the, the hotel staff and, and pose as these people. When the tourists returned to their rooms, they found them ransacked. Over several days, Mansoor had stolen more than a quarter of a million dollars in cash and jewelry. We have been completely robbed. We have been robbed. Everything is gone. Agent Backen believed the suspect would use the money to flee Nevada. We obtained an unlawful flight to avoid prosecution warrant, which is a federal warrant. Uh, charging him with fleeing one state, going to another uh, to avoid prosecution for the underlying charge, which was sexual assault. Uh, with the federal warrant, it allowed us to engage other FBI officers around the country in searching for uh, Mansoor. They tried to narrow the scope of the nationwide search by reviewing any piece of information they could find regarding the suspect. 
we were able to uh, gather INS records, immigration records, that type of stuff, and we found that he had been in, in their custody for, for a great deal of time. And, uh, and he was here citing some sort of religious persecution. Um, and then we were able to pull in the, the records from uh, New Jersey and the, the other places that he had been at. We found that he had been involved in gambling fraud, generally property crimes types of things. Mansour's wife gave them long distance phone records which showed many calls to casinos around the country. We began developing a profile of him as, as a gambler and once we did that, we focused our, our investigation on the gambling establishments. One of the gambling communities they notified was New Orleans. Casinos there should look out for it. On the morning of January 9, 2001, 29 days after the Las Vegas sexual assault and kidnapping, a man in an obvious wig appeared at the New Orleans airport Paying cash, he booked a flight to Las Vegas under the name Francis Gabriel. In the middle of the transaction, he changed his destination to Los Angeles. There you go. Thank you. Ticket agents are trained to spot suspicious activity. Security, please. Yes. She notified airport police. The wig, cash, and odd behavior was enough probable cause for the undercover officer to question the man. He followed him outside, then asked to see his identification ticket. I'm asking you, you got your ticket. authorities would learn the identity of the carjacker and join the hunt for an elusive fugitive. Yeah, I'm at door 6A. Uh, you ran up on the roof. In January 2001, Las Vegas authorities hunted fugitive Magfor Mansour, suspected of robbery, kidnapping, and sexual assault. A month later at the New Orleans airport, a man in a disguise assaulted a police officer, then escaped in a carjacked pickup truck. Undercover Jefferson Parish police assigned to the airport reported the incident. And an APB for the truck and its driver went out to police in nearby parishes. Thirty minutes later, the St. Charles Parish deputy spotted the pickup truck 10 miles from the airport. He called in the plates, confirming it was the stolen truck. But the deputy knew there was construction ahead, so he did not pursue at high speed. The truck entered the road construction zone. But the driver was not going to stop and swerved toward a highway worker. The St. Charles Parish deputy arrived seconds later. Seeing the worker down, he called for an ambulance, then went to check the truck. The carjacker was gone.
At the airport, police searched a piece of luggage the fugitive had dropped. Since it was left unattended on airport property, Lieutenant Gwen Toka did not need a warrant. We found some identification with a photograph of the suspect, an Italian passport. When we checked that, it was found to have been a stolen passport, which the suspect had obviously placed his photograph on. Police also found a list of stolen credit card numbers, players' cards from casinos throughout the United States, and multiple social security numbers. Because of possible interstate fraud, Jefferson Parish Police called the New Orleans FBI. They forwarded the photo and name used on the stolen passport to Special Agent Sandra Zuli. We immediately started running that name through our system to try to identify photographs of anyone that, that used that name. The photo of fugitive Magfour Mansour, wanted out of Las Vegas, matched the one on the passport. Calling Vegas to learn more details, Zuli confirmed it was him. Despite the best efforts of the emergency personnel, the highway worker died of his injuries. Authorities began their search for Mansoor at the truck and worked out here from there. Lieutenant Toka joined the search near the Mississippi River. We did about a mile radius uh, search, plus the state police helped us on, on the perimeters that were doing the search. We had a helicopter up, plus we had uh, tracking dogs in the location. The area's landscape made it difficult. There are buildings, uh, tugboats, wharves. It's a, it's a working area, and there's a lot of abandoned warehouses there, uh, derelict barges up on the ground and everything. They searched for more than 24 hours, checking every conceivable hiding place. We uh, theorized that he had either gone into the river and drowned, or that he had made his way out of the uh, security envelope. Still, authorities had to assume that Mansoor was alive. They hoped to determine where the fugitive had been while in New Orleans. Perhaps he would go back there. They reviewed airline passenger lists and surveillance tapes to reconstruct the fugitive's movements. The day before, he had come down from Connecticut into New Orleans, and we were able to track him to some local casinos that he was at that night. And then the next day, he was supposed to be flying out, and that's when he was confronted by the officer. Mansoor's behavior pattern was clear. We felt that eventually he would show up at, at a casino, and that's why we focused on the casino security departments to make sure they were alerted to look for him under, in, in possibly a disguise. Mag for a mod Authorities also broadcast his photo and the aliases he used, hoping the public could help find him. Anyone with information was asked to call a dedicated tip line. Police immediately began receiving sightings. One came from a motorist who thought he had seen Mansoor the night the highway worker was killed. The motorist said that night he'd been driving behind a taxi on a road near the airport. He saw a man come out of the woods and hail the taxi. It looked like Mansoor. But police could not find the taxi driver, and the trail went cold. We were receiving numerous reports of, of individuals who they felt looked like, like this individual walking down the road, uh, sitting at a bar, at a casino, and all of these were checked out. Yet none of the sightings led to Mansoor. The next lead came from officers patrolling the nearby Mississippi River. Shortly after the disappearance, 
we received a call of a body that they located floating at the bank of the river. And we knew that in the file from the Las Vegas division that we had dental records of Mag Fuller Mansour who had dental work done while in prison. So we obtained the dental records and had a comparison done. The records did not match. Mansour's whereabouts were still unknown. And now that he was wanted for killing a man, he'd be more desperate than ever to avoid them. Wanted on a charge of sexual assault and kidnapping, fugitive Magfour Mansour disappeared from Las Vegas. Weeks later, he resurfaced in New Orleans where he carjacked a truck and killed a highway worker. Not only was he moving quickly across jurisdictions, he was also using multiple identities, according to FBI Special Agent Sandra Zuli. Mag Fuller Mansour utilized so many different aliases. We determined that he was stealing identification cards on a regular basis while he was staying in the, in the casino area. The player's cards that we located in the luggage were determined to be stolen from casinos. Some of those players' cards were from casinos in Atlantic City. To follow up on them, Louisiana agents contacted the FBI's Newark Field Office. Special Agent Joseph Fury checked on a casino player's card Mansoor used under the name Yasser Hamid. I called the hotel casino and talked to the senior vice president in charge of security, and he advised me that Mr. Hamid had in fact been a player at their casino and on January 3rd of 2001 had played and won approximately $50,000. That was six days before the airport incident in New Orleans. But considering Mansoor's lavish gambling lifestyle, the money probably would not last long. If he was desperate for money, we thought he might come back to Atlantic City to gamble again. Agent Fury learned a New Jersey phone number had been found in Mansoor's luggage. We didn't know the reason he had the number, whether or not he had ever called the number, or who was on the receiving end of that call. Okay. Authorities traced the number to a house in the Atlantic City suburb of Brigantine and set up surveillance on it. They knew the house belonged to a local cab driver, but little else. Agents watched on the slim chance the house might be connected to Mansoor. Other teams of agents also searched the gambling community of Atlantic City. We distributed wanted posters to all of the hotel casinos in Atlantic City, as well as Atlantic City Police Department and New Jersey State Police. Someone, somewhere, was bound to run into the elusive killer. Yet months went by with no sign of him. Then, at an Atlantic City hotel on the night of May 4, 2001, a vacationing Pennsylvania state trooper and his wife returned to their room. Honey? Yeah. And discovered they weren't alone. Get over there. Everything's fine. Shut your mouth. Here's my wallet. Right I'm not worried about that. The trooper recognized Mansoor from wanted posters. He knew the man had killed before. But for some reason, Mansoor left without harming the couple or taking any money. The state trooper notified the hotel about Mansoor and asked them to call the FBI. Yes, right now. Call the FBI. Mansoor had emerged from hiding, now with a gun, again a threat to anyone who ran across him. Yes, thank you, Mike. Are you okay? As the case progressed, I knew he was a desperate man, living a life of luxury, which he didn't earn, and he was desperate to avoid law enforcement contact. Two days later, at 6.30 in the morning, a casino ATM alerted hotel security of someone attempting to use a stolen credit card to obtain a cash advance. 
Come here a second. I need to show you something real quick. Check this guy out here on the uh, ATM machine here. Why don't you go check that out for me and see what's going on. One of the hotel security officers confronted the cardholder, who calmly explained the card belonged to him. He claimed he had reported it stolen, but found it again that morning and forgot to cancel the hold on it. Asked for identification, the man handed the security officer an Indian passport that had been obviously altered. When the security officer tried to bring the man in for questioning, he pulled a gun, then fled. Though the officer didn't know it yet, the man he was trying to take into custody was Magfour Mansour. The suspect jumped into a nearby taxi and forced the driver to help him escape. Hotel security called the incident in to Atlantic City Police. Several units mobilized to find the carjacked taxi. But once again, Mansour was one step ahead. When he got distracted, the driver took a chance. Minutes later, witnesses outside the Taj Mahal casino saw a well-dressed man leave a taxi idling at the curb and disappear inside. Fielding the calls about the incidents, Atlantic City police believed Mansoor must be involved. Authorities immediately responded to the Taj Mahal. Witnesses' descriptions matched the fugitive and detectives found an altered Indian passport, the one from the ATM incident. The photo was of Magfour Mansour. The cab driver stated that Mansour told him he would shoot and kill him, as well as any police officer who stopped him, and he would not go back to jail. At that point, we kind of stepped up the investigation, knowing that it wasn't a one-time incident, it was an individual who was on a crime spree and seemed to be on a downward spiral. Magfour Mansour had eluded authorities for months. Now, as agents surrounded the massive Taj Mahal casino, they hoped they finally had him cornered. The FBI sought Magfour Mansour for kidnapping, sexual assault, carjacking, and second-degree murder. He had eluded them in Las Vegas and New Orleans. In May of 2001, he surfaced in Atlantic City. Hoping finally to stop him, FBI Special Agent Joseph Fury organized a search of the hotel casino Mansour was seen entering. We established a command post at the Taj Mahal with the Atlantic City Police Department, the New Jersey State Police, as well as security personnel from the Taj Mahal in an effort to locate Mansoor, thinking that he may be in the hotel somewhere. But Mansoor wouldn't be easy to find. The 1,200-room hotel boasts a 135,000-square-foot casino and is often filled with thousands of guests. And in service areas, there are dozens of hallways with plenty of offices and storage rooms to hide in. Investigators had to clear each one. Clear, coming out. Authorities feared Mansoor had escaped again. 
They broadened the search area. New Jersey State Police and Atlantic City Police canvassed the entire hotel casino, as well as every hotel casino in Atlantic City. They found nothing. Somehow, Mansoor had slipped away. Investigators requested security tapes from all Atlantic City hotel casinos, hoping to find a lead. After reviewing hundreds of hours of tapes, they finally spotted Mansoor. He was getting out of a cab. Checking the taxi's identification number, state police learned it was owned by an independent operator living outside of Atlantic City in Brigantine. I asked what the cab driver's name was and the location where they were going, and they told me a name which came back to the individual who I had been surveilling in anticipation of Mansoor returning to the Atlantic City area. Authorities returned to the Brigantine house with a search warrant and a SWAT team. The SWAT team moved into position. To get the cab driver out of the house, an agent called inside, posing as a dispatcher. He told the driver that one of his regular fares needed a ride. We felt that if Mansoor was inside, it might be a hostage-type situation. But the driver emerged alone, and they pulled him away so they could talk to him safely. The driver said no one else was in the house, but the arrest team had to be sure. All clear. It was another disappointment. Authorities returned to the state police barracks to interview the cab driver. He said he had driven Mansoor around the Atlantic City area several times in recent years. They had become friends, but now he was more than willing to cooperate. He immediately told us that Mansoor had been at his house that morning, had pulled a gun on him, and had ordered him to drive him towards Philadelphia, which was approximately an hour drive from Atlantic City. He actually drove Mansoor into Philadelphia and dropped him off. The driver hadn't called police because Mansoor knew where he lived and he was afraid he would come back to get him. Fury notified the FBI's Philadelphia field office that Mansoor might be there. I then drove from Atlantic City to Philadelphia with pictures of Mansoor and assisted the Philadelphia Division. Sir, uh, FBI. A the agents went to a bus station near where Mansoor was dropped off, looking for anyone who had seen him. We showed the picture to several counter attendants, one who recognized the picture and said that Mansoor had purchased a bus ticket to New York. Yes, sir. It seemed Mansoor had gone to Philadelphia only to make his trail more difficult to follow. On May 9th, 2001, the FBI added Magfur Mansoor to its 10 most wanted fugitives list. This made him a top priority for every FBI agent in the nation, according to Task Force member Brian Dunaway. Him being on the FBI's most wanted does a few things. It, it, it allocates a, a great deal more resources to the investigation, and it places a $50,000 reward for his capture. The following day, security at Atlantic City's Taj Mahal Resort reported that a gunman matching Mansoor's description 
had robbed the hotel jewelry store of $300,000 worth of watches. Surveillance video captured the plate number of the limo Mansoor used to escape. At the Newark field office, the FBI questioned the limousine driver. He said he had picked Mansoor up in New York City earlier that day. When Mansoor had called for the limo, he asked to be picked up on a certain street corner. The driver didn't know where he was staying. He said Mansoor seemed like any other high-stakes gambler. But around 8 o'clock, he heard security alarms. Then Mansoor jumped in and ordered him to speed away. The driver followed orders. Mansoor had a gun. The fugitive got out of the limousine five blocks from the robbed hotel and hopped into another cab, a white Crown Victoria with New Jersey plates. The FBI asked local police to issue an all-points bulletin for white Crown Victoria cabs in Atlantic City. That night, police stopped every taxi matching the description. Eventually, they found the driver who had picked up Mansoor. He reported that he had taken the man to Philadelphia and dropped him off at the airport. The FBI learned that only two flights had departed Philadelphia late enough for Mansoor to have boarded. Both were bound for Las Vegas. Manifests did not show Mansoor's name, but he might be flying under an alias they did not know yet. If Mansoor were on either flight, authorities in Las Vegas would be ready for him. In the pre-dawn hours of May 11, 2001, the FBI believed deadly fugitive Magfour Mansoor might be aboard one of two flights to Las Vegas. New Jersey FBI Special Agent Joseph Fury kept working as the planes traveled cross-country. I contacted the Las Vegas Division to advise them that Mansoor had committed the armed robbery in Atlantic City, and he may in fact be en route back to Las Vegas. The Las Vegas Police Department, as well as the FBI, were at the airport waiting for both planes to arrive. Vegas detective Brian Dunaway had been tracking Mansoor from the beginning. He knew how dangerous and desperate the fugitive was. Everyone that we had talked to, um, everyone that knew anything about him knew that he wasn't going to go back to jail. He had made those statements, and his actions were just of such desperation that, that he wasn't a person that wasn't going to face these charges. And his previous incarcerations and the, the records that they kept on him there, there was just no way he was going back. So he, he was going to go out in a blaze of glory. Mansoor frequently used disguises and false IDs to travel. But he wasn't on the first flight. When the second plane landed, agents cleared it too. From the limo driver they'd interviewed, they knew he had last stayed in New York City. At that point, I contacted Special Agent Ted Miller of the New York Division to advise him that Mansoor was not on either flight that went to Las Vegas and it would be more likely that he would be in New York City. Reviewing Mansoor's phone records from Las Vegas, agents interviewed Mansoor's associates in New York, reminding them of the $50,000 reward. Eventually, they tracked down Mansoor's regular limo driver in the city. In New York, it's very hard to get a taxi cab, and you have several private limos that will be at your beck and call. And this limo driver was 
willing to drive Mansoor because he seemed to have quite a bit of money. He said he hadn't seen Mansoor recently. But on previous trips, he always picked Mansoor up from the same Midtown Hotel. Okay. If you think of anything else that might help us, please, please give us a call. Okay. The limo driver was cooperative and was going to take them to an area where he thought Mansoor was staying. It was approximately 6 in the morning when Agent Miller advised me they had located the hotel. FBI agents, New York City police, and U.S. Marshals headed to the hotel. Special Agent Timothy Letourneau was part of the arrest team. We got a call from Special Agent Miller saying, the subject Mansoor committed an armed robbery last night at the Taj Mahal Casino in Atlantic City, and we believe he retreated to New York, and we think we have good leads that he may be at the hotel located at West 47th Street. The investigators set up on surveillance outside. Before the stakeout, they had been briefed on the case and warned of the danger. We talked about how he brandished a handgun during several crimes he committed. We talked about the armed rape of a 17-year-old girl and a murder he committed in Louisiana. So we knew about his propensity to violence. Several investigators went to check with the front desk. The clerk was able to confirm that Mansoor had used one of his aliases to check in. He gave them Mansoor's room number, but didn't know if he was there. Our plan at that time was we were going to make a ruse phone call into the room. We believed Mansoor might be staying in. We had agents outside the room. We had agents in the lobby. What we decided to do was a wake-up call. If he answered or we heard stirring in the room, we would know he'd be in there, or someone would be in there. We made several calls. And we got no response telephonically. We heard nothing in the room. Mansoor must have gone out. They hoped he would return. Hours later, they spotted him. He was alone and heading back into the hotel. This time, they wouldn't let him slip away. Mansoor had long vowed not to be taken alive. He went for a gun and aimed at the detective. From the time I saw the gun to the time my weapon was fired, you're talking about two or three seconds. Well, not a whole lot of time to think about it. Um, you have innocent civilians in the lobby. Missing isn't an option. Even with three nine-millimeter rounds in him, Mansoor continued to struggle as they took him into custody. Because of their training, the arrest team was unharmed. Things had to be instinctive. Things had to be committed to muscle memory. And those reactions that occurred that morning were reactions based on excellent training. They were the byproduct of great training. So um, my, my recommendation to other agents would be receive as much training as you can. Try and get, the, uh, get, get it to the point where it's instinctive. The pursuit of Mansoor had lasted five months, involving more than a dozen law enforcement agencies. New York City emergency personnel tried to stabilize Mansoor, but he died en route to the hospital. His rampage was finally over. Not any one law enforcement agency can handle an investigation of this magnitude by themselves, and without the cooperation and efforts of all of the law enforcement agencies, I don't think Mansoor would have been caught without causing harm to someone else.